vast bulk of participants um, engaged in the survey in an online manner. So we had an anonymized staff record. We were able to push uh, to an email. Effectively, everyone on Garda Síochána can be emailed by their, uh, their staff number, and you can push out an email. So without any of my team knowing who they were emailing or where they were or what part of the organization, we could push it out. It also meant that people could fill it in on a Garda device, or they could forward it on and do it on their mobile device or their home device, all designed to drive participation. Um, there is, you'll see in the main report, in the written report, there's two different survey response rates. We also had 1,100 members of the organisation who had to complete a paper survey. Uh, they were either overseas or on long-term absence or, um, were on, uh, or, or were staff in uh, cleaning or facilities who didn't have a regular email address or a, a guard on email address. We had a much lower response rate on that cohort. So survey goes live, we get 6,560 responses. Shade under 6,500 online, that gives a 42% online response rate, and then about 60 um, survey responses on the paper base. Um, so that blended out to a 40% response rate overall, which we were really happy with. That quant analysis and the analysis of the verbatim, the open texts, um, allowed us then to set up a number of themes that we wanted to bring into focus groups. So the survey methodology was always designed to do a comprehensive, a universal quant, and then bring it into focus groups. Um, we got uh, 21,850 uh, open text responses across three different parts of the questionnaire. People took a huge amount of time. Obviously because it's online, I can't tell for the paper, but for the online, we know that on average people took 25 minutes to complete the questionnaire. Some outliers on either side of that, but broadly, it's a big investment of time for 40% for of the organisation to put in, and, and hence my thanks. Um, and as I say, over 225 members took part in the focus groups. So, and then all of the findings completed, all the focus groups done, bring all of that quant data, and then having explored the kind of the detail behind that, the focus groups, bring all that back into a report, which we uh, published uh, last Friday, and we're here to discuss, debate, and take questions on today. So I just want to run through kind of the, the survey findings, if you like, the kind of the, the mathematical or quantitative findings, and then I want to step back and take a couple of moments on what does that summarize up into in terms of uh, cultural insights and what, um, what have we derived across the whole uh, survey in terms of the culture of Angarda Siakana. And then I want to talk a little bit about kind of recommendations and next steps. So to take the first bit, uh, code of ethics. And before I jump into this, let me just explain how the survey questions work. All of you who will have done questionnaires where you have a series of statements and 10 is strongly agree and one is strongly disagree. And what we took was, if I take an area, if I take the code of ethics as an example, we would have had a principle within the code of ethics like police powers. Um, and then we would have had, in that case, we had four statements underneath police powers, which averaged up. So what you're looking at when you see a score of 8.6, the average of the four underlying statements across everybody in the organization all averaged back up to a score of 8.6, right? So what does an eight mean or a seven mean or a six mean? In our experience and our view across organizations, a score of 8.0 and above is strong cultural alignment to the statements or the set of statements. Um, a set of six, a score of 6.0 to 7.9 is good, but definitely room for improvement. And anything at 5.9 or below is poor or misalignment for the population you're looking at with those cultural values. Uh, the, the reason I'm stressing that a little bit is when I first presented these results um, to some groups, people immediately dived on, well, five must be good, because that's the average of one to 10. Five is not good. Uh, we're shooting for scores here in eight. So um, in the code of ethics, we end up with some of the pillars getting a score of over eight, right? Police powers, information privacy, and uh, honesty and integrity. Um, and then we have a bunch that move down through that six to eight band, and we have two, transparency and communication, and speaking up and reporting wrongdoing, which scored below six, so poor scores on each of those two dimensions. And that's, remember, that's a composite score for all grades, all ranks, all geographies, that's the entire population. 
Just on that entire population, one thing I should stress is uh, partly driven by the high response rate, but we got a really strong alignment between the sample group and the overall population. So when we test the sample group for gender mix, for rank or grade mix, for geographic population spread, we get a good spread, uh, we get a good alignment with the overall, uh, the total population. So we think those are strongly accurate scores for the total population. If I look at the modernization renewal program, uh, scores are slightly lower, right? So uh, we get no dimension of the MRP that's scoring in the eight or above range. Everything is either in the six to eight or below six. And again, some alignment with code of ethics, things like listening and empathy, um, open to change, the same kind of things about being able to speak up um, and, and challenge, it's going towards the bottom. But, but good scores on trust, accountability, engagement, feeling empowered, and so on. An overall score on the MRP of 6.2. And then if I take our overall cultural reinforcers, uh, really none of the score, vision and values managing to land at 6.5, but really none of the score is coming out strong on dimensions like leadership management, learning development, organizational design, and so on. If I just step back a moment, um, one, of the, one of the hypotheses we have off this data is when you look at the dimensions that were, are within the code of ethics, they're very tangible. They are very... Uh, there are things you can really get to grips with and get your hands And when you look at the statements, um, in, the, in one of the appendices at the back of the report, it gives you each individual statement that rolls up um, to each of these pillars. And you can see, in some cases, why you'd get stronger scores. And we have a theory from the data that code of ethics got you a 7.2, 6.2 on MRP, and a 5.1 on cultural reinforcers. And as you move across the different tangible documents we base the survey on, the scores get weaker. Um, and that's important when it comes to recommendations later because one of our beliefs about culture is if you just want to game the survey, you'll go and try to move, you'll take individual statements and try to move the statement. If you really want to try to fix the culture, getting some of this soft is making people sure that people are aligned with the, the vision of the organization, that they feel connected to leadership, that they feel recognized for the effort they're making and that poor effort is also recognized and challenged and dealt with. Some of those things will move some of the more tangible scores as well. But, um, as I say, each of those gives you a, a different set of scores and a different set of data to, uh, to look at. Um, sorry, the text is very small, but I'm going to draw out the main points on, on some of this for you. We also asked three completely open text questions. This was pre folks group. This was just in the questionnaire. Um, and one of the questions we asked was, tell us, with a completely open text box, just tell us what it is about Angarad Shiakana that makes you feel most proud. Right? And we took all of the thousands and thousands, in total across the three open texts, we had 21,850 responses. We coded each of those and tried to put them back against a, a particular dimension. Um, there were two on this that scored more than 10%. There was a score of 19% for community involvement or serving the community. So if you just pause on that for a second, in a completely unprompted open text box, one in five members spontaneously talked about serving the community. Um, and we tested that in the focus groups, and over and over again, people told stories about, you know, I get up, I go to work because I feel I'm doing something good for the community I live in. I feel like I'm making a difference. And, and actually, it was much more holistic. In the focus groups, we got stories about my professional life as a serving member of the organization and my personal life, where I volunteer or I engage or I, I feel I contribute to my community in other ways. But really strong scores around community. And a score of 14%, uh, so 14% of the responses talked about the strength of my team, camaraderie, feeling like I'm part of something, feeling like, like I belong, that esprit de corps. Um, so some really positives there, and I'll talk about some of the overall positives in the report in a moment. Um, we also asked them the flip side. We asked them the reverse of that question and say, what is it about working in a garage of which you feel least proud? Um, and again, if I just focus on the answers that got more than 10% of the respondents, um, same format, completely open text box, 17% um, of members talked about senior management or leadership issues, expressed in various ways, but feeling like um, I'm disconnected from them, I wish they'd stand up for the organisation more, I wish they were clearer, I wish there was a stronger message from leadership. 11%, um, slightly over 1 in 10, talked about recent scandals, public image, um, feeling disconnected from the organization. And we explore that in the focus groups and people talking about um, less and less being prepared to kind of jump to the defense of the organization in general, out of uniform type conversation. 
um, and 11% poor performance. Um, and came up very strongly um, in both the quant data, in the unwritten comment, in the um, unprompted comments, and in the focus groups. This issue of poor performance not being dealt with and not being addressed, and being individual members being able to see uh, people not performing and not being uh, tackled. And uh, the other, the third unprompted question was. Um, Think about if someone you knew was joining on Garda Shia Khanna, what would you tell them are the unwritten rules uh, that shape the organisation or the unwritten rules you would give them advice on? Some interesting dynamics come out of this. 22%, um, so over one in five of the members, uh, talked about promotions based on who you know, right? that it's not a meritocracy. Um, I, I should say it wasn't our scope or purpose or objective, and we didn't. Um, try to explore any facts or evidence. We were simply trying to look at the culture. And, and the reason I think that's important is whether that is true or not, there's a feeling of disconnect between the members at one part of the organisation and leadership. And there's, there's a belief, there's a strong enough the belief that, that people wrote this down. Um, keep your head down, don't challenge. Uh, got 15%. Work as a team, 13%. So again, playing back to that teamwork and camaraderie. Um, and cover yourself. Uh, cover your back. Um, that was written in both positive and negative sentiments, but 13% or one in eight members would offer that up as advice to someone joining the organisation. So that gave us a richness to then go and explore in the focus groups and try to scratch behind some of those themes and understand what had people really meant uh, by those. Before I jump to those, which it just might take a moment, and again, in the written report, and I'm happy to take questions, there's, there's more detail on the demographics, but there's a couple of interesting uh, things on the demographics. Um, can I step away from this mic? Yeah. So if we look uh, here, right, uh, what this is showing, and again, very small text, the columns here are length of service. So this is less than one year, this is one to three year, this is 25 years plus service, right? The big red is between seven and 15. So what do the reds and greens mean? Um, again, in one of the appendix, this is fully printed out with all of the scores. So if I get a score here of engagement on MRP, if 6.8 is the global average for everybody, what we took, the color coding means green is better than 6.8 to a level that's statistically significant. So a real marked difference. White is broadly the same, and red is worse than the average to a level that's statistically significant, right? So forget the statistics and the maths and everything else. In layman's terms, the group that are more positive about culture and feel more alignment to MRP and code of ethics are the group who are close to retirement with more than 25 years service or have just joined the organization and have less than three years service. The group that feels more negative than the general population is that group with seven to 15 years service. Now, just as a caution, green doesn't necessarily mean you got a good score. So remember my caveat that you had to get eight and above to be a really strong alignment with the, the code. It just means you're scoring better than the rest of the organization, right? So we have a group in the middle who are feeling uh, in some way disengaged or less engaged than the general population. If I look at that then by rank, uh, the first column where you get lots of greens and some light greens, which means slightly uh, better, is the Garda Reserves, but there's a very small sample size on the Garda Reserves. Sample size was 35 to 46, so park that for a moment. Garda rank, sergeant, inspector, superintendent, chief supers, and uh, assistant commissioners. And, and what you've got is the Garda rank being the lowest, right, and below the average, despite the fact that they're a big driver of the average, if you consider the size of the cohort. Um, and then... If you had numbers filled in on this grid, the numbers get progressively better as you move up. So the more senior you are, if you're a, gar if you're a police officer, if you're a sworn member, the more senior you are in the organization, the more positive and aligned that you feel uh, to the culture. Uh, I'm, just, I'm gonna throw up the civilians on the same. So I've got clerical officer through to HEO admin and senior civilian management. Less definitive, but it actually says it's the reverse. So if you're a civilian in a Garda Shikona, you're broadly in line with the average, right, um, at the lower grades, and the more senior you get, the more negative you get on the culture. All right, so the opposite of the, uh, the sworn ranks. 
So when you put all of that data together and you bring it back in without trying to drill into the demographics, just looking at the population, what does that tell us about the culture of Angarda Sheikhana? Um, and there was eight, looking at the quant, the open text, some interviews we completed with senior management, the collection of focus groups, we, we kept coming back to eight big cultural insights. So, um, small is beautiful is the first one. We are very committed to our immediate te teams, right? And we feel a very strong esprit de corps. Um, if I was to, we had questions in there that talked about I, right? So me as an individual, we questions talked about the team that you're a part of, and we had questions that asked about Angar the Sheikhana, the full organization. The scores get progressively worse, right? So across any dimension that I want to look at, I believe, right, I'm doing a great job, I am upholding the law, I act with honesty and integrity, I'm a super guy, I believe my team does a pretty good job and I believe the organization is not doing such a good job. Right? Um, but, the, but the team is really important because if you, if you look at the, there's some really strong positives in this survey and in this report, and one of them is about that, that strong sense of alignment to team, that strong sense of service to the community, um, and that strong sense of variety and a feeling of, my engagement stays up because the job keeps changing all the time, came out as real strengths. So small is beautiful. Next one is silence. Uh, silence means survival. Um, so came out repeatedly across all of the different uh, testing dimensions that there is a, there's a concern about being able to speak up, being able to... <laughs> Speaking up. I should, I should not speak up. <laughs> Right, so, so, uh, so generally, again, you get a sense of I, right, so the I have the personal courage to speak up, but I feel as a group or as a collective that we don't. And when you probe that, uh, people don't use these two words, but when you kind of condense it all down, you get back either to fear or futility, right, uh, fear of the consequences of speaking up. And I'm not talking about massive the uh, aggressive negative consequence, just a feeling of like good things will stop happening as opposed to kind of massively negative and a futility. There is no point because nothing will change, so why would I, uh, why would I bother? Uh, we succeed despite ourselves. I think this is important. There is a very strong uh, can-do attitude, a real sense of, uh, and, and the subtext, and I, I, again, the text is small, but in the detail, what they talk about is we feel we don't have the right equipment, right? whether that's ICT equipment, the right cars, uh, the right uniforms, uh, we don't have sufficient uh, training. So you get a whole bunch of negatives, but actually, when you bring it back into the focus groups and you look at the numbers, what the organization is really saying is we can get stuff done, and we do, and we get on with it despite the fact that we haven't uh, been uh, fully equipped or, or equipped as we would like. Uh, one rule for me, another for everybody else. Uh, so a sense that um, I feel I'm held to account, and when I do something wrong, I get a snap on the wrist, but I see lots of examples of people um, not being held to account and not being challenged for poor performance or poor behaviours. It's all about who you know. I mentioned that in the open text box, but this sense that uh, promotions are based on who you know and who you are connected to and less on merit. Box ticking trumps the human touch. So a lot and a lot of emotion on this in the focus groups in particular where people talked about the, the job has become a huge amount of compliance, having to write stuff, having to write why you're doing stuff, having to write why you're not doing stuff, and less about uh, what, what would be termed or described as policing, right? Being actually out and about um, and doing so. And again, not my job to assess whether that's right or wrong, but there's a really strong feeling about that, that box ticking and becoming a regular. People make comments like, why would you want to be a sergeant? All you do is have to kind of write up forms and, and complete documents. Um, captives, not champions. Um, one of the standard kind of questions uh, favoured of people like me who do surveys like this is, do you think you'll be working in this organisation 12 months from now? Right? Um, the overall score for the organisation is over nine. Right? Huge alignment and a huge belief that, yeah, I'm committed and I'm going to stay here. Um, but then on a, would you recommend it to a friend, you get a really low score. Right? And normally you'd expect a correlation. Right? If I'm going to stay here, and I'm, like, if I ask that in a general organization, I'd expect a strong alignment between those scores. You get a, a much bigger divergence. Right? Um, now, 
at the same time, people's friends and family do join the organization, but there's, there's a, a sense that I'm going to stay here and stick it out, but I'm not sure I'd recommend it. Um, and when we explore that, a feeling of frustration, the job has changed, some of the previous comments. Um, and then a supervision vacuum. Um, this, this came out, um, we probably first started seeing this theme emerge in the focus groups and the interviews, and then we went back into the quant as opposed to the other way around. But a sense that the sergeant um, as, as a rank, as a grade, is less visible, right? So older members of the organization talked about, you know, when I left Temple Moor, the sergeant would tell me what I was doing right, tell me what I was doing wrong, give me feedback. More modern probationers will talk about, well, the sergeant's busy behind a desk doing stuff, and I feel I get less supervision. And, and we pull that all the way up as a cultural insight because uh, a couple of things, um, all of the, and there's much better academics in the room than me, but a lot of the academic research will talk about the importance of your first boss and the, the impact and the impression that your, your first boss or your first supervisor makes. We would see it all the time across many organizations. That supervisory grade has a huge impact on the behaviors of the organization. Um, and if, if we've got guards, sergeants, and, and ranks above sergeant all feeling that frustration, um, there's a problem. And again, you know, you will get lots of different views on whether that's quantum or uh, the work that they're doing or the work they've been tasked to do or whatever, but there's definitely a feeling of not enough supervision. And if you want to drive behaviors which will characterize values, which will help you to change the culture, getting that supervision piece right is going to be key. So, um, recommendations. We have pages and pages in the report, and all of Chapter 6 talks about the recommendations in more detail, but I just wanted to pick out a couple of things and try to stay on time to let the discussion happen. So, um, I'm not going to drain this slide and go through every one of them, but a few things. If, if we really, if you want to change some of this, and my strong uh, recommendation to, to everybody in the room, really, and all the stakeholders is, don't, don't try to game it. Don't try to get in and say, I'm going to take question 41 and I'm going to brief and train and workshop question 41 so the next time people are asked question 41, I get a higher score. If you want to, if you want to really change the culture in any organization, but particularly here, you, you've got to start with something more holistic. So leadership needs to be much more visible, uh, much more out and about, outdoing town halls, talking to people, making people feel like they're more connected to leadership. We need to create a better culture in the organization around speaking up and saying it's, and, and I'm not talking about protected disclosures or formal, I'm just talking about in an informal sense, feeling that ability to challenge. There's some basics that need to be fixed, there's some basic equipment, the uniform is a, and again, not my job to talk whether the uniform is fit for purpose or not, but there's a feeling among the regular uniformed units that leadership don't understand how frustrating the current uniform is um, from a practical, functional point of view. Um, accountability, and that's really about driving accountability down into the organization so people feel the right people are being held to account for actions and that performance is being uh, managed. Merit-based promotion, uh, again, you've got to change the mindset that says uh, based on merit. The supervision vacuum, uh, I've talked about that. Integration of civilians is important so that we, we get to a point where everybody feels fully part and connected to the organization. Um, a new approach to change management is one of our recommendations. Avoid that comprehensive, all-encompassing, sweeping, multi-project program type approach. Um, and try to build on the positives, right? So, uh, you know, it's easy to flick through the report and pick out some of the negatives, as some of the journalists did over the weekend. Um, I, I think there are some real strong positive messages in there. And there's, there's, a, there's, there's a really strong culture in the center of the organization that you need to build on and, and try to use to counter. Much easier to start from position of strength. Um, and then our overall sense and our overall recognition is some change is needed here, that this is, uh, this is a culture that, that needs to go on a journey. I believe, yeah, that's my last slide. Thanks everybody, Thank have to take any questions.
dictate the future. And with that um, important sort of backdrop statement, I'd like to invite the current Chief Inspector, Mark Toland, to make some remarks, ask a question, whatever. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, David, just congratulations uh, to you and your team and the advisors. Uh, it's a really good response rate because quite often you do a survey with your staff and trying to get them to complete it. So I think it gives you a really sound basis for making some assumptions or presumptions. Um, the audit was a recommendation from us, so we're delighted to see that that took place. We felt at that time to achieve real reform and change needed a significant cultural shift. Uh, as a former senior police officer, and most of you would be managers, it's sometimes really difficult to get critical feedback and sometimes you can be defensive. So I've been on the receiving end of similar feedback, but it's important to acknowledge that this is how the staff feel. Some of it might be perception, some of it might be reality, but this is how people feel. Uh, one of my previous senior managers always used to say to me, Mark, feedback is a gift. It was normally immediately before he was going to tell me off for not doing something <laughs> right. Um, but it's about embracing that gift and doing something with it and taking the ball and, and running with it. Uh, when you have such rich feedback in an audit like this, I think it's important to celebrate the positive attributes, the esprit de corps, the sense of teamwork and camaraderie. But importantly, you need to respond to the critical issues. And, and some of those things are, are probably quite easy to fix. Some of them will be more difficult. Uh, we're coming to the end of our last or latest inspection. I hope it's not our last, uh, but our latest inspection. So we've been going around speaking to Garda members, Garda staff, and to reserves. There are three things that have featured here today that uh, people have been telling us. One is people can't physically see visible change, meaningful change. And I think staff are skeptical, and I notice it's in your report, that will an audit like this or another inspector report actually mean change? And if so, why are they participating in interviews and workshops? There's real concern about supervision, and we spoke to John and the commissioner yesterday at that front line, first line, managerial level, sergeant rank, a real absence of sergeants out and about in, in guard stations, uh, going to critical incidents. And, and it's something that superintendents and chiefs, sergeants and inspectors and guards have raised with us. And the last one is the perception of unfairness in HR practices. And I can remember those from my days in policing. And, and I think part of the thing that we've tried to do is to say, to get professional expertise at divisional level around HR issues because people don't have confidence in selection processes, promotion processes, and that's something that as an organization I think needs to be addressed. I'd like to finish with a question for David. I hope it's not a hard one, but this gives you a great basis for monitoring the progress of the Garda Shukana over the next couple of years. But are you able to benchmark them based on this analysis against other police services or private or public sector organizations to see how they compare? Okay, I, now, I was going to yeah. invite the, the Chair of GSOC, Judge Mary Ellen Ring, to maybe respond or react, and maybe if she has a question, and then get you to, take the two, yeah. to wrap the two together. Is that okay, Mary? Josephine, yes, congratulations, David. If reading through this, I think what's really important is the engagement of people. Sometimes, whatever the outcome, the really important part is asking people what they see. And whatever the outcome, that can often make a real difference. Particularly in an organization, and people in this room may be in organizations where change is taking place, and at different levels, people feel left out. So the fact that you offer them the opportunity, you can them Insofar as my own experiences, dealing in you thought you're dealing with the complaints, the public who feel dissatisfied dealing with guards who feel dissatisfied. Um, I'm going to just mention the positive, which is in the last two and a half years of attending at Temple Moor and the passing out parades and seeing the really talented, really committed people coming into this organization. Uh, they're coming from professions, coming from teaching, coming from business. And so you know they're financially suffering They've made a conscious decision to give up a job that may have prospects, so they're financially making a decision to step back, go into a new uh, job. They have families, a lot of them, and their families are committed as well. So you've got a wealth of talented 
uh, well-educated people coming in and uh, they're coming in big numbers. Uh, and so you've got people are there for 35 years plus uh, and a whole cadre of people who potentially have huge uh, gifts uh, in terms of their talents, skills and experiences to offer. And how you blend those all together, keep the positive enthusiasm going uh, and yet deal with the more jaded, uh, experienced uh, personnel is a challenge for any organisation. And so some of what you're seeing here it could be reflected in, in any large uh, organization undergoing change and modernization. So uh, while people might see it negative, I suspect if you looked at other uh, groups who were looking at bringing in large numbers, some of the challenges that are set out here would be set out in those organizations. Uh, some of the issues clearly we would see, accountability we have a complaint against an individual or an individuals, they feel their work is under the spotlight in a way perhaps their colleagues uh, isn't. And often they feel unfairly, and they're right, they are unfairly uh, under the spotlight, uh, and uh, in due course they will be, um, their position will be confirmed. Um, they do often feel that nobody else is there with them. So the lack of supervision is something we see in, in, in examinations and in investigations. Uh, individuals may be at fault, but behind them, who is there? Who was watching out when they were carrying out the work, or more importantly, neglecting their work? And yet, as an organization, we may not be able to tackle those issues. So supervision is not surprising to us, uh, and the role of the sergeant, we would agree, is hugely important both in setting a tone, but also in getting individuals uh, to do their job and to do their job well. So some of those uh, recommendations we would say are important, must be followed through, uh, and uh, we um, would support that. Clearly, issues of speaking out, uh, again, that can be in terms of just your job, but it can be in terms of bigger issues. Uh, and we've had to deal with some of those issues since 2014. Uh, and we hear the frustration um, from people. So it's good that we're not just hearing, but uh, you've heard it, David, and, and your colleagues, uh, and clearly the organization is hearing it. Um, I'll finish by saying I think the engagement that's been started is good to continue. The conversation that's been started is good to continue. We at the moment have members of Vanguardia Shirkana working with us um, and I presented them with a copy of the report because it relates to their organization. Um, and I said, look, it's for you to read, it's for you to digest, and uh, it's for you to have uh, views on. And uh, I left them engaged with the, um, with the report. So I, it has to go back. I mean, in this room, there are managers, there aren't members. So it's really important members read it and feel they've been heard and more importantly that there are outcomes that they can visibly um, benefit from. Thank you. David. Thank you. Um, maybe just pick up on a couple of those uh, points. Uh, well Mark you asked about comparisons elsewhere. Um, we were very keen at the beginning, because one of the debates we had when we were setting this thing up was, are we going to try to do a benchmark or are we going to try to do an audit baseline, right? So there was very much a sense right from, right from the beginning that we wanted to do something that was tailored to Angar the Shiagana. So, so hence the emphasis on the MRP and the code of ethics, um, as, a, as opposed to, for example, doing a more uh, a standardized approach. Um, the other thing is a lot of the... Um, uh, a lot of the surveys that take place across policing organizations, uh, some of them, uh, like in Angarda Shiokon as well, are staff engagement surveys. And, and it, we were trying to do something slightly different here than staff engagement. This was trying to baseline what are the values and behaviors that you see um, evidenced around you. And uh, we're trying to get to something different. So 
That's a long answer to no, I don't have a direct comparison, right? Um, but there's some interesting tie-ins around the response rate, how strong a response rate we got, um, and uh, some of the scores, if I compare them to other policing organizations or, t or even to some of the civil service engagement surveys here in, in Ireland. Um, and if I could use that to segue to Mary Ellen around the, the response rate, we were really pleased, right? I mean, we, we knew going in, that historically driving a response rate in general in a survey like this, but in particular in a Garcia would be difficult. We'd set ourselves what we thought was a really aggressive target of trying to get to, to something beginning with a three, right? If we could have got to 30, we would have been oh, delighted. And, and we looked at places like uh, New Zealand Police, West Midlands, Scottish, who'd kind of started in kind of lower numbers and gradually over a series of iterations got to a higher number. Um, we were really pleased with the, to, to hit and land on 40. Um, the one thing, and, and you touched on kind of engagement and continuing the dialogue, um, one of the statements was, uh, do you believe, or, or the statement was phrased as, you know, I believe that action will be taken as a consequence of this survey. And the average on that one was 3.7, the average. Um, it was one of the th third or fourth lowest um, of all of the statements. And, and so I, I think we've got a great response. And I'm, I'm acutely conscious as well that because we didn't want any, there was no interim reporting because from, from most members of the organization, they completed the survey in October or November and they heard nothing about it until last week. And, and that was deliberate and that was part of our design because we didn't want it leaking out in dribs and drabs and then people going into a focus group having heard something about it on the radio and that coloring their view. So we were delighted with that from a survey methodology approach, but from an engagement, you, you now need to get back out there and start start talking. I know the organisation's picking up on that challenge. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, just for good order, just so everybody knows, um, unfortunately, Commissioner O'Hulon couldn't be with us uh, this afternoon, but uh, Deputy Commissioner Toomey is here, and at the end of the event, uh, I'll invite John to, to respond. So I'm not ignoring him, just because he's hanging out over there at the, end, at the end of the platform. So now the floor is yours. It's open for questions and comments and principally questions uh, addressed to David about the survey, about the report. Um, so who's going to be brave and, or else I'll put my, I will point at somebody, Pat. I was going to point at Pat. <laughs> Pat Costello uh, is a member of the authority. All right, thanks very much. David, well done, a really good piece of work. I think it's going to be critical uh, for the Gaudi Shikana going forward. Um, and and you know, there's lots of things wrong, lots of things have to, have to change. Um, and, lots, and often I think you find people will be you know, wondering, will it happen at all? Will the change happen? And it is very, very difficult to change culture. Uh, but it is possible and lots of organisations have done it. So I suppose my question is, um, when would be a good time uh, to repeat the survey? And hopefully we'll have good news that we're on this journey, we've made good progress on the journey. And that would be really important because then people say, yeah, God, it is happening. We're going to get in behind this. So what would your recommendation, recommendation be of when to repeat the audit? So I, I think a couple of things on that. I, I, I agree. And, and, and this was always set up as an audit baseline, right? So, so as I've been trying to convey the results management saying, just take this to the starting point. What happens now is can we move the needle on some of this? Um, I, I think um, for a full repeat of this kind of 18 to 24 months, I think you need to leave sufficient time to, to have some change happen and for the organization to feel the change, but I wouldn't leave it much longer than that because it creates too big a gap and, and you'll have other variables influencing kind of what the data is telling you. So at the outside, 24 months and, and somewhere in that 18 to 24 month window. That wouldn't stop you, Pat, doing, you might want to, depending on what interventions get selected, you might want to do a pulse survey on a particular cohort, you might want to measure a particular dimension of it, but for the full repeat, to give you some longitudinal data, I would go with 18 to 24 months. Makes okay. sense. Vicky, okay, for the benefit of viewers, and forget sometimes that there might be an audience out there, you might just say who you are. Um, Vicky Conway, member of the Commission on the Future of Policing um, and an academic at DCU. Um, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, so, one, as the academic, I do has, have to ask any chance of the qualitative data being released. I know we've got all the quant here, but that would be, it would be really useful. And, you know, at part of this point about moving towards transparency, it would be very useful. Um, one question that strikes me is that often in 
we have an incredibly rich baseline here of how guards are feeling across a, an enormous range of issues and it's really incredible to have that data. But often in the police culture literature, it would take that further and start to question, okay, we know how their guards or police are feeling, how does that influence how they act? Because of course the really striking thing about police is the power that they have and the discretion that they have in individual moments. And I'm wondering if you um, converted, I suppose, or started to analyze things in that perspective at all. So, you know, the police culture literature would talk about things like practice, pragmatism, a thirst for action, cynicism, yeah. machismo, all of that. Um, so I wonder if you've done any of that. And then finally, I noticed that there is some um, interesting points around different attitudes by gender. Um, and I wonder if you explored that in the focus groups and if there was also any other diversity issues, um, whether you looked at um, ethnicity issues, sexuality, whether any of that managed to emerge and whether that provoked any interesting yeah. points. Okay, so let me kind of rattle through those reasonably quick. If I'm going too fast, then you can rein me back in. On the qualitative data, no, right? And let me just explain. One of the things we did very early on, this is the release of qualitative data. Uh, one of the things we did very early on was we wanted to establish a safe environment for people to speak up. Um, and we went to great lengths both in the organization, we did multiple briefings with the unions and associations, we wrote formally, from, not, not through the Commissioner's Office, but from PwC to the unions and associations, assuring them that no data would be released at a cohort less than 30. Right? It's why in the report we don't have district data, because there are, there are a number of districts where we didn't get more than 30 respondents. Right? So, and, and the qualitative, so 225 sounds like a lot of people, but there's a full schedule of where the folks groups were. I would be concerned that so, and, and the technology we use for the folks groups means people are writing. It's not captured, but people are writing their own comments. So I would be concerned about releasing the data. Um, so no, unfortunately, sorry about that. Um, uh, let's take the other two questions, right? So uh, I, I, I get the point about um, the academic, we looked at a lot of the academic uh, literature around police culture. I, I think we did talk to behaviours, right? Because we believe that behaviours are very, it, it's easy, you can describe a set, you can describe a culture of an organisation and you can write down a set of values and put them on a poster on the wall but people will really believe the behaviours. We got a great anecdote in, in one of the focus groups about, this was a senior officer talking about doing an interview where the candidate wasn't <coughs> able to recite the values of Agartha Shiakana. Um, and she thought she'd failed the interview. And, and he went back and said, well, actually, you know, everything you've described in how you dealt with that stop, how you dealt with that arrest, how you dealt with that domestic um, issue, is describing the, be the behaviours that I'd want to see described in the values. So, so we think values are really, behaviours are really important, and much more so than writing down or codifying, and, and we try to get to behaviours. Now, did we get to where the academic literature would go to around uh, fear, bias to action? I, I think there's some of that in there. This is not an academic piece of research, right? For, for part of the reason I'm not going to release all the data and, and, and put it out there. So I probably fail on that front, but I think there's some behaviours in there that, that do correlate. We went back at the end of all this and over the last couple of weeks reviewed some of the academic literature again. And, and we think there's some lines you can draw between our report and the academic literature quite strongly. Um, your last one then was on minority groupings, right? Um, so... Uh, the sample sizes are, are quite... So on ethnicity, gender, uh, we can identify from the files. Um, on uh, sexual orientation, on LGBTQ, you had to self-identify, right? So you, you had to tick a box on the questionnaire to say, which also meant we had a problem that we couldn't go back and do focus groups with that group because I had no anonymous way to go back and, and reaccess that group, so that's a difficulty. Um, that group, so if I take uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, and ethnicity, um, the, uh, there is, you get lower scores on things like equality and ability to speak up than the general population. So, so yes. Okay. I, now, I'm searching again for uh, volunteers. Judith. Uh, good afternoon. Judith Gillespie, member of the Policing Authority. Thanks very much for the presentation, David. Uh, there was a very stark difference in the response between civilian members of the organization and sworn police members of the organization. 
Um, and I wanted to ask you two questions, if I may. The first is about that in particular. Was there anything came out of the focus groups in terms of the qualitative responses uh, that um, became a theme in terms of the responses from staff, police staff? Because civilianization or professionalization of the police service is a key challenge across the world, but in particular for the Garda Síochána. And my second question is, is maybe a forward-looking, broader question. Now that we know all this, what needs to happen next? Okay. Um, so if I take the first one, civilians, and particularly an emphasis on the qualitative or the focus group um, output, um, yeah, that, that's something we explored. So we had some focus groups that were mixed, uh, civilian and sworn, and we had some that were civilian only. Um, what, what I would say is... Uh, there is a really strong feeling of a disconnect in the civilian group, with, with some exceptions, but by and large, not feeling fully integrated into the immediate teams even, or the organization, feeling slightly separate. Um, in the focus groups, we explore that, that pattern in the data where uh, you know, the more senior you get, the more disillusioned, but you still get lower scores in the general population in the lower grades. Um, and, and if I take the two groups, at the, the lower grades, it can feel I'm not fully integrated, I don't feel really part of this, and at the more senior grades it can be frustration, right, that I'm, I'm not connected in. I will, just the general theme and initiative and efforts around civilianization, what the focus groups brought back to us was an interesting split between uh, mid-ranks and, and lower grades, because, and I'm talking about the Garda response to this. So when you explored in the focus groups with mid-ranking guards, civilianization as a theme, you got going to be really difficult, very hard to do, lots of challenges with that, um, lo lots of things that will be really difficult to execute on. When you went down to guard rank, you, you, you got a much more pragmatic response. I, I get that civilianization is beneficial and necessary, and, and I actually, I joined up to be a police officer, but we got very pragmatic things like, I've been behind a desk for 10 years, so can you, A, can I have a chat about my childcare arrangements, because I've now based my childcare on nine to five, Monday to Friday. Can I please get some retraining, because it's a long time since I was out on the street, and I'd, I'd like to kind of get picked up on that, right? Um, and and could, I, could I just get a chance to kind of adjust and, and migrate, but not a resistance to it as a... So I, I, I think there's a dialogue that could happen there that I think would be more positive around that. So I was on civilians and the qualitative. The second one, Jude, sorry, was this, what needs to happen. Um, I'd probably let some of the Garda members talk to that, but if I can give a view, right, based on what we've seen, right, I, I think there is a strong, there's a strong desire for something to happen, right, and, and I've got the answer. So the organisation has said, we're not happy about a bunch of stuff here in documents like the MRP and Code of Ethics that you've told us are important, and we'd like something to change. Um, and my strong urging is... Uh, it, it comes back to our PwC's core belief around how you really espouse a strong culture and organization, and it's by behavior being evidenced. Um, and if you ever wanted an organization that is trained to be professionally skeptical um, about what they see and gets presented to them, and will only truly believe it when they've some hard evidence, not a poster or a document or a brochure, but, but what I see. And it's why I think the sergeant is so important, and it's why I think the, the behaviours that get demonstrated by leadership at every grade, I mean, not, I'm not talking about the commissioner or the deputy commissioner, I'm talking about at superintendent level. What does my inspector do? What does my, for the vast bulk of the organisation, they don't interact above superintendent ranks. So what do they see at the, the ranks between them and there? And what behaviours, and it doesn't matter what I learn in Templemore, what's written down in the Code of Ethics, the MRP, the culture will be what I see it. And it is in every organisation. That's not a, a Garda specific, but in any large organisation, I will read the theory and then I will see. And the far more evidence will be what I see as the behaviour. So, so I, 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 my strong urging is what needs to happen next is a, a, a short period of reflection about how do we deal, because this is a big shockwave through the organisation. So we need to give them some time to reflect on that, but then think about what are the behaviours and who are the exemplars who are going to pull out to try to do that, rather than try to tackle all 83 questions and, and have a programme against every one of them. Um, 
which I think could be spreadsheet mania. Please encourage you to recommend that either. Okay. We've had spreadsheet mania on a few other things. I have Peter Castles and then Eddie. Peter. Everybody sees it as two ranks above them, right? So, so in the questionnaire, we, at, we specifically said in the information page, which is the first page you land on, um, we define leadership in this questionnaire as the, what's called in the guards the senior leadership team, so assistant commissioner, um, executive director and above. But actually, when we went back to the folks who said all these scores on leadership, the focus groups came back and said, and, and depending on what folks group you were doing, but it was typically two ranks above. So, so if I'm a sergeant, I'm talking about inspectors and superintendents, or sorry, if I'm a guard, I'm talking about inspectors and superintendents. If I'm talking about sergeants, I'm unequivocally talking about supers and possibly chief supers. Um, if I'm a super, I've given my chief a pass, but I think the assistant commissioner isn't doing such a great job. So two ranks above. The second question, uh, it jumps out there, the groups between 7 and 15 years service, right? So what do you think was driving that? Is it just the lack of promotion since the whole crash and collapse in that? Or are there deeper things that, that work I, I, I think there's a, a couple of hypotheses and, and some things. I don't, have, I don't have a really strong evidence base, but I'll tell you some things that are emerging that we think kind of line up to this. Uh, one is that is the group. So if, if you think about the last kind of 15 years, you had accelerated uh, recruitment cycles in the noughties. Um, and just as that group, that 7 to 15 group, kind of hit where they should have been kind of coming into their stride. Um, and that's not always promotion up the ranks. Sometimes that's availability to work on specialized units or particular teams because variety comes out as something that I really want as well. You hit a point where the organization got hit with a triple blow, right? Uh, you turned off the tap on promotions and recruitment. You turned off the tap on a lot of spend. Um, which, which meant that equipment was deteriorating over time, whether that was cars, physical facilities, whatever. Um, and at the same time, you got hit with a whole bunch of scandals and public discourse on Igar the Sheikhana that was demoralizing uh, for those in the fourth. So, so I think that cohort has taken, as opposed to the group of 25 years plus, are, they're not always more senior, because you can be a 25 years plus and be at Garda rank, but, but they feel they've seen the kind of the good and the bad, and the group at zero to three years are still full of the enthusiasm and energy of, I've just joined, I've always wanted to be in the guards, I've been trying to get in for a few years, I'm in now. So uh, the other thing I would say, Peter, is having a lower score in that seven to 15 cohort is not hugely unusual in an organization, right? The difference here is that captive score. So. In my own organization, kind of people at seven years and over will, will feel much more able to leave, right? They don't feel tied um, in private sector organizations the way they do here. And in the folks who people talk about pension, commitment, unsure about transferability of skills, other things like that. So you get a, you get a challenge there. Eddie. Eddie Malloy, I'm a member of the Commission on the Future of Policing. Um, I don't have any questions for David because I was involved in the project from uh, throughout. I would just uh, take the opportunity to underscore just how big a challenge this is for the leadership of Angarda Siakona. Um, the fact of the matter is that the culture that you've just seen uh, set out um, was created and sustained by the leadership within the organization. They are the carriers and custodians of that culture. That's where it came from and is sustained. And is also sustained through an internal promotion process whereby being a good cultural fit is actually one of the keys to being promoted. And by way of a story, I spent a week in a hotel with the 35 Catholic bishops wrestling with something similar in the Catholic Church. And one of them said to me at the end, you can't get change, he quoted Jesus. He said, uh, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. I asked him to explain the words of Jesus. He said, you can't get changed through us because we're at the root of the problem. So this is a huge opportunity, but the big challenge, you know, what next, will be for, to, to, to bring together, however it's done, a critical mass of people in the senior echelons of the guards who are up for this. 
because it can easily be killed off like lots and lots of other reports. So in the context where there's now the, the uh, recruitment process for a new commissioner, achieving that critical mass of people who are really up for it, and being up for it is not something you can fake. You either are or you aren't. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Helen. Andrea Helen. Thanks very much, Josephine. Um, David, I have two questions, if I may. Um, one of them, there is a, a theme which is talk, talks about box ticking trumps the human touch. And, and I'm just a little bit curious about that and wondering whether you got any, um, anything from the focus groups around that. And in particular, I suppose, as an authority, one of the big themes or issues we've struggled with and focused on is around data quality and accountability and how one must, especially with police powers, how one must actually document some of that. So I was just wondering, my question is essentially, did you sense a resistance to that, that box ticking comment? Was that a resistance to accountability and documentation? And after that easy question, then I have another one, which is just in general, again, through the focus groups, do you think that there's an acceptance uh, throughout the organization from the people you've met that this might be about me? And what I mean by that, that you know, sometimes people say, oh yeah, senior management, my goodness, you know, and there's the old adage of when you, you point a finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing at you. Um, and do the middle management blame senior management and senior management blame middle management? Potentially, I'm just wondering, did you get any sense of that? Do people, are people prepared to take personal ownership from the farthest within the organization. Thank you. Okay, two easy ones, right. <laughs> um, box ticking. Um, I, I think this is, like, this is an easy soundbite. It's very nuanced, right? And, and I think there's a lot of uh, challenge and richness, and we try to bring some of that out in the, in the text of the full document. But if I, just a couple of comments on this, right? Um, there was definitely a sense that there's a pendulum has swung from where I have huge amounts of discretion and very little oversight to, you know, now everything's got to be logged, recorded, written down, captured, because whatever decision I made, even if I chose not to make a decision, I've got to be clear on what I knew at that time and what, uh, what were the factors within that. Um, one of the frustrations is purely practical, right, which is there is a challenge for officers coming out where you need to put it in your notebook because you might need your notebook. You also need to get onto Pulse or some other system because you might need it there as well, right? And a, and a, a frustration of I've got, to, I've got to do it twice. And, and so I get that I've got more recording to do now, but why do I have to do it in, in two different systems, right? If you, if you call the paper and pen. It's, I'm a big fan of paper and pen, so I have no problem with it, but just it's, it's the two. So that's, that's one challenge. Um, I, I think it's that feeling of I'm not... I'm, I'm doing this because... I've got to cover my rear, right? And I'm, I'm doing it, and that's why it's, it's that box ticking thing. I'm doing it to be, because everything is subject to scrutiny. Um, and, a, and a feeling from the folks groups that I better have this because I'm no longer convinced that, the, that everyone will have my back in the organization anymore. That if I'm caught without this, right? Um, and, and it's funny, if I can go back to some of the academic literature, what, what some of that comes out very strongly on police culture in general is, there's a general trend towards you are more likely to get in trouble for not having done the process than you are to get positive reinforcement for having done something substantive, right? And, and that can be a real, and we saw evidence of that coming through in the focus groups. So um, you, you didn't introduce yourself, but for all the viewers, Helen Hall, Police Authority, right? So uh, given, given your role, um, I don't think, I, I think there was an acceptance across the organization um, of, of oversight. A big frustration, and forgive me for all the bodies in the room, with, with the, the variety and number of oversight bodies, and sometimes even an uncertainty of who am I accountable to, right? Is this going to be me on my own, or is my super actually responsible for this, or will this stop? At this, like where, where will the accountability sit? And people are very unsure and unclear, which leads to, I better just write everything down just to be absolutely covered. And I'm not, that box ticking tumps the, the human touch is, and it goes back to that 19% of community service. What people want and what people joined up for was to be doing policing in whatever shape or form that takes. And, and they don't necessarily equate form filling with policing. Uh, 
That's a lot of answer. I'm not sure we got to that. The, I, I could talk about the box ticking one for hours, so I'm happy to revisit it if, if, we, if we have time, but let's take that one, right? The sense of, um, are, 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 am I, right? I as an individual in the organization, am I up for this and am I, re um, well, well, let me say that what the survey says is yes, we want things to be different and we want stronger alignment and we would really like something to change and be different, right? So, so I, I take that as a positive. I, I think it is difficult. It is a, it, a, a, a this is an observation based on the data, not, but it, it is a very siloed organization, right? So, so it is hard to create connections and to, to spread. It is not as networked as, as you might imagine. And by networked, I mean that there are points in the organization that are connected sideways and up down to other parts of the organization. People are very focused on their immediate team. Right, um, and I mean that in a positive way. I've got a team. I'm rostered with them. I come to work with them. We have a particular job or operation or mission that we've got to accomplish, and we're going to do that. But gossip spreads. But but actually, hard, tangible things. I'm not sure those kind of neural pathways are there to kind of spread the messages. And I think that would be a challenge. So I, as an individual, you remember what the data says. Is I actually think I'm already doing a good job and I'm being held accountable. So do I need to change? Possibly not. But I still think the organisation needs to. And I think it is about finding the individuals who have both, who believe in the change and are prepared to stand up and, and, and are already networked, because there are definitely individuals who are kind of well connected. And they're not always at grade or rank, sometimes they're just in the organization. Before I, just before I pass on to the next question, Dave, I want to elaborate a little bit on the one Helen was asking. Because one of your key cultural insights um, in relation to the box ticking is that there seems to be a presumption that scrutiny will be unfair. So I can understand, you've explained very well, the kind of view that I better write a lot of things down because it will be scrutinized. Yeah. And that's sort of, on the face of it, it's quite reasonable. But you added the word unfairly scrutinized yeah. in the cultural insight. So could you yeah. tease that one out for me, please? And it wasn't my word. I, mean, I, beg, your, I beg your pardon. <laughs> But um, no, unfairly came out. Now, unfairly doesn't. Um, I, I can see why you would read it and jump to external bodies. Unfairly, first off, starts in the organisation, right? So, will I be unfair? I mean, like some of the comments that came out were, "The more you do, the more potential you have to get yourself into trouble," right? So, so why would I put my neck out? Because I'm literally putting my neck out in the historical sense of I might get my head chopped off, right? So I, I, I think the unfairly starts at home, right, and then spreads from there. I, I, I do think um, when we explored this, people recognized that external oversight is, is broadly positive. Um, they particularly referenced it in relation to promotions and the fact that, um, so if I go back to one of the big themes around promotions and meritocracy, welcoming that there is more external involvement in the promotions process is seen as a positive thing. But it is that, that general culture of everybody has the right to come back and look at my work and will they always take it in the context in which it happened? Will they remember the situation? Will I have captured everything I need to show that I didn't have that piece of information when I made that particular decision, or I didn't know that? And you're now looking with 2020 hindsight. So unfairly wasn't a, uh, there isn't a straight line between the unfairly um, word straight back out to external oversight, but there is definitely a sense of, you know, that level of oversight and that pressure on me as an individual in the organization is, is difficult to deal with. Okay, thank you. I have Antoinette and then Bob, and then I'll come to you. Maybe we'll take the three and before yeah, we give sure. you a chance yeah, to draw your fine. breath. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Josephine and uh, David. Thank you very much on behalf of AGSI for the presentation here today. I suppose our executive met this morning for the first time since the publication of the report last Friday. We had a lot of detailed discussion around the findings of it and that. And um, I suppose, look at, uh, as people who work in the organization every day, we have an executive of 13 people, most of whom work on the front line, so who are everyday operational people. And before I go into some of the other issues and some questions I have for senior management, and Mark, if he doesn't mind taking one, is the effect that uh, the publication of a report like this, um, because some of the issues in this are not a surprise to AGSI because they are matters that have been well flagged for many years by this association uh, without, uh, it has to be said, an adequate response from the organization that we work in. 
I suppose one of the things that we're particularly pleased about is the reflection of how much policing in our communities does mean to this association. Because I can tell you, on the front line, we would never go home from work if somebody in our community needed us. And we would never allow people to walk off the job if there was something in our community that had to be done. And I'm very pleased that the report reflects that. But I can tell you, it is the operational people on the front line that are delivering that service and not anybody up in the higher parts of the uh, community as far as we're concerned. And it is those people who take their work home with them. But you know something, the effect of not being listened to, the effect of uh, fear of reprisal from talking up is devastating for people. And for years we've been hearing people saying, oh, morale in the guards is rock bottom. Why is it rock bottom? The survey findings bear out the exact reasons why it's rock bottom. It's because people work under conditions of fear, not being listened to, not being valued. One thing I do agree with what you said, David, was the sergeant is one of the most important ranks in the job. But I can tell you, our association feel it's the most undervalued. Our people are broken from the amount of work that they have to do. They have serious welfare issues, which were very well highlighted at our conference this year. They're suffering from work overload. And please don't tell me that accelerated recruitment, which began almost three or four years ago, did not mean accelerated supervision. So it can't be a surprise that we needed to wait until May 2018 to correlate one of those with the other. Accelerated recruitment will always mean accelerated supervision is needed. So why we have to wait until this survey finding comes out to address that issue is amazing, really, because this association has been flagging that for the last four years at least. I'd like to ask just Garda Management the question that I heard asked earlier on. What is actually going to happen now? Because I can tell you from the grouping that we represent, they don't feel that there's any change happening in the organisation, which is extremely disappointing, I have to say. And the second question I'd like to ask is, and I would like Mark from his pre previous police experiences, what role do you think staff associations can play in this? I'd like just to ask Mark that, if that's OK, and also Deputy Toomey later on. Is there a role for staff associations here in this? Because we believe there is. We believe that unless it's bottom up and top down in collaboration, that no ch change can take place. But our association certainly feels undervalued in any of the change processes that take place, yet we, we feel we are critical to them. Thanks very much. Thanks, I'll invite the people on the podium at the end to pick up themes, um, including those direct questions. Uh, Bob, please. Um, Bob Collins, uh, a member of the Policing Authority. Uh, it's impossible to be in this physical structure and not reach for a scriptural text. Uh, and it struck me that by their fruits you shall know them was the appropriate one. Then Eddie uh, raised the stakes and all I would say in response to what Eddie said was that the reply to the bishop might have been that Jesus put new wine into old bottles at the marriage feast of Cana. And I think it's impossible to wait for change to begin because of the urgency that's reflected in this document uh, and in all that we know. I think there are remarkable insights and remarkable, a remarkably positive contribution to understanding uh, in this report. And it is a gift, uh, to pick up a point that Mark made, it is a remarkable gift from the 42% of the membership of the organization to those who lead it. And one of the challenges of leadership is to bring people to unfamiliar destinations. And within the people are the leaders themselves who also need to bring themselves to unfamiliar dest destinations and to feel at home in those un unfamiliar destinations. This is not just about the Garda Sheikhana, it's about everybody in every aspect of life. Um, the, the extent to which there are negative comments is also a reflection of profound insights within the organization about the nature and character of the way in which that organism operates and the lived experience of people. And that has to be valued as much as the very substantial positive dimensions that are there, reassuringly positive dimensions from the point of view of the commitment of individuals to the service of the rest of us who are the public. But two things leap out at me in relation to this. The first is 
the identification of the significance of the supervisory vacuum. And at the same time, almost one in four of the respondents not trusting the promotion process, not being convinced that that will select the best or that that will be fair, one has to assume is what they mean. There is a conundrum there in that it identifies the problem but questions the available solution. And the second is the 3.7% on average who expect that anything will happen, <coughs> which, which was where we came in, by their fruits you shall know them. And this is the challenge, to do things which are dramatically different from anything that has been attempted before. If, if I will not be, um, I won't want to say excommunicated by the chair of the policing authority for expressing a personal view, it seems to me that if almost one in four people distrust the promotions process, for whatever reason, good, bad or indifferent, the only way to resolve that is to take the promotions process out of being an internal activity and to subject it to some degree of external engagement, invigilation, supervision uh, or wholly conducted externally. But those two things, it seems to me, pose a, a real challenge to, to ensuring that the next time any such survey is done, it will be vastly more than 3.7% to expect something to happen because they will have seen something happen. Thanks, Bob. I wouldn't dream of excommunicating you. The gentleman here, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Jane McGilloway, uh, Ulster University. Uh, there's a striking photograph on, um, I think it's page five of the report, um, it's, uh, I think it's an incoming, or the incoming cohort. Uh, it's certainly a classroom full of um, guard officers. Um, and it's notable that they're all, um, they're all white and I think overwhelmingly male. And I wondered whether um, uh, police officers use their powers uh, differently depending on who they encounter. One of the enduring tropes in the literature is that Officers use their powers differently if they encounter young men from ethnic minorities in cities. Uh, did you ask about it, I wonder? And also whether they, um, uh, how they investigate gender-based violence or domestic abuse and so on. Uh, the second question is about, um, it's about patterns in the statistics. It's hard to know if you're measuring disillusionment or cultural values. Um, there seems to be an overlap between the two certainly in that 35 to 39 year old cohort. But there are also other anomalies. The first is um, officers in Dublin seem to deviate um, from the, the kind of the, the picture perfect idea of, of what a, a good culture supposedly is, uh, especially in Dublin North Central. Uh, did you ask in the focus groups about it? And the second I thought it was surprising too was um, in the Garda College, I think more than any other section of the force uh, officers seemed most perhaps disillusioned, but if it is a measure of culture, the furthest away uh, from that cultural ideal, which seems important. Uh, uh, and again, same question, did you inquire into it? Yeah. I might go back around, and some of the questions weren't for me, but I'll just go back around kind of quickly in reverse. Um, on, on your first question there about the, the Temple Moor class, or I think it's a Temple Moor class. I knew we shouldn't have put photographs in. Um, the the um, that, that that's a standard stock photograph from the Garda archive. Like I, I don't have. We didn't look at. Um, we made sure that our sample was corresponded well and was statistically aligned with the Garda population. You're asking a much broader question about is the Garda population aligned with the general population? So I, I, I don't have that. And, and you're also, did we ask specific questions around how uh, guards would treat um, uh, people who are different to them as they encounter them in the role? And I've no explicit kind of questions or data point around that, right? We, so it, we, weren't, we weren't particularly exploring that either in the survey data or in the vote. There's some stuff that's implied in there, like treating people with respect was asked a number of different ways, uh, equality, respecting difference. So there's questions like that in there, but nothing as explicit as, you know, what would you do in this situation or that situation? Um, your other question on the regional differences, um, 
so clearly a man who's read the full report. Um, the, just on the, on the DMR, on Dublin metropolitan region, um, I, I think one of the interesting things about the regional differences is, is um, the, the region, it's not a geographic region, but the region that scored best was special crime operations. Um, and one of the regions that scored weekly was DMR. And, and I, I think there's a, there's a hypothesis there that says they're, they're two sides of a seesaw. Because one of the things that came out in the focus groups was uh, regular uniformed units feel uh, neglected and forgotten. Um, and if you're in a regular uniform, and, and members on regular uniform units feel that the way for career progression is to get out of a regular uniform unit, and, get, and there are much greater opportunities in DMR to do that, because a lot of the national teams, whether that's traffic or SEO, a lot of those are based out of Dublin, right, and give you opportunities to, not even through rank career progression, but moving into kind of different, so I, I think there may be a counterbalance between the high scores. One of the things we were told in the folks groups is the best and the brightest, and that's not my phrase, that's a phrase, the best and the brightest get pulled out of DMR and pulled into special crime ops, so um, I think that's a feeling of members on the ground. Um, just to, two comments, Bob, and I know, Bob, your comments are more, I think, for others on the panel, but supervisory vacuum and promotion process. Again, I just want to reiterate for the room, we didn't do any detailed analysis of the promotion. I don't have hard data to say whether, you know, what, what, what is the role of the sergeant or what they do or don't do or whether the promotion process is fair or not. What I do have is data that says there's a massive disconnect between different parts of the organisation, between leadership and guard or rank, as to their view of those things. And, and if I take stuff like the supervisory vacuum, I think it's a contributory factor um, to uh, the challenge of trying to reinforce a positive culture. Um, and Antoinette, I think, I think most of your questions were for my colleagues to the left. There was something, yeah, you mentioned a couple of times where you thanked me for comments in the report. The report reflects what the members said to us, right? So it's, it's not a, an editorial license of PwC, it's what does it, you know, and I, I think there was a really good response rate. And it was thanks to, I think a lot of it was thanks to the, the superintendents at, at district level, but also the unions and associations that know had a big part in uh, helping to drive that. I think those were the kind of main points directed at me, if that's okay, okay Chair. You. Just to um, <coughs> elaborate a little bit for a moment on the promotion issue, to say that there is another piece of work uh, done in 2014 by the Commission for Public Service Appointments, which has another data set but comes to the same conclusion about the perceptions of unfairness notwithstanding, um, uh, and that does look in detail at the promotion system for sergeants and inspectors, and it it echoes that, it has other conclusions, but it echoes that conclusion as well. So there's other, there, there, there's other data there that can be called on. Uh, Tim, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tim Dalton, I'm a member of the Policing Commission. Uh, I was looking in this report, and congratulations by the way, David, it's, it's, it's an excellent job, and it's a very valuable contribution to the discussion on policing, but I suppose uh, I've been around for a little while, and uh, I suppose I was looking for something that was surprising, uh, something that was different. Uh, and I'm a bit concerned about the general impression out there in the community, and uh, coming from Leinster House and other places, which is almost universally negative. And uh, I think it's killing the Gardaí, it's killing morale, it is making people fearful. Uh, I wonder have we gone too far with this. There's nothing in the way of support. I mean, if you're going to reform an organization, you don't do it by kicking people into reform. You'll draw them into reform. And I have the feeling that uh, the way things are going now uh, is certainly not, it is not a positive in terms of achieving reform in the Gardaí. I'm just wondering if that came out uh, very much in your survey. I think Mark asked a question early on about comparisons with other organisations, and you said that it wasn't possible to make comparisons with other police organisations. But I'm just wondering about domestic uh, large organisations, public and private sector, some of the problems that they are, mainly because they are large organisations. I mean, the HSE is an example. But the Gardaí are, are portrayed now almost as a basket case, uh, a completely uh, dysfunctional organization by comparison with others. I just wonder how true is it? I mean, is, is it, are they suffering from the kind of problems that all organizations uh, suffer from? Is there something extraordinary about the Gardaí? Because I think if as a community we continue to portray the force as an almost, as I said, a basket case, 
uh, it's not going to serve the community and it's not going to sec uh, secure change. We just jump back for a moment to the first part about that balance in the discourse around Angarda Shigana. If if I wanted to, if I was a journalist and I wanted to pick up this report, I could write a story that leads off with here's an organisation that's very uh, focused on community service at every rank and grade. It got a real can-do attitude and focused on getting things done. Um, would like to have more sergeants, would like to have better equipment. I, I could write that as a story. Uh, no journalist over the weekend chose to write that story. Um, and I, I think there is, a, there is a narrative that you can pick up. And, and we're just, again, to the point that Antoinette made, we're just trying to reflect what the members said to us in the survey data. Uh, to go to your broader question about, is it as bad and as dark, right? So uh, you're right, large organizations will struggle to drive a consistent culture throughout the organization. And, and, and we would argue the mark of really successful organizations in any field of endeavor is the ones that can manage to do that. Because I, I think culture is especially important in large organizations because you need the person at the end of the line, whether that's a police officer or an air hostess or a salesperson, to do what you want them to do when nobody's looking. Right? And, and that's what, and when there is no oversight, to go to an earlier theme, and that's what culture gives you, because I've learned a set of behaviours that tell me what is expected of me in this situation, right? I haven't got it from a code book. Um, but some of the other stuff, I mean, if you go back, if, if I take in Ireland, uh, the Civil Service Engagement Survey got a score in 20, got a response rate, sorry, a response rate in 2015 of 39%, so you look at that, and they did much better on the last go around. Um, in 2017, but you look at that and say, yeah, that, that's okay, that compares really well against us. They have a problem with a frustration with poor performance management, and you say, well, that's common across the civil service and the, um, the police force, um, and, and that's common to public sector employment in Ireland. You, and you get, and you see frustration with higher grades and lack of visibility of what leadership are doing. So, so you will get some comparators. Um, I, I do think there's things in there that you would like, to, and it goes to the heart of so much of the execution of policing and what the public sees of policing happens out of the sight of any oversight, right, and, and out of visibility. So if, if I'm working in, if I'm working in an office, let's say I was working in the Revenue Commissioner's hypothetically, right? right? Um, far easier to have visibility, far easier to see what's going on, people are sitting all together, people typically are office-based, audits and so on notwithstanding, right? But a vast amount, she's going to contradict everything I say now, the, a vast amount of policing happens out of the sight of anybody bar the officer or officers responding to an issue and the member of the public, the victim or whomever. Um, and I, I think that's where culture becomes so important. So, so I'll stop making a long-winded answer. I think there's some correlations, but I think it's even more important for policing to ha and law enforcement to have a strong, positive culture. Thank you, and you're right. I'm not going to contradict everything, but I, <laughs> a former colleague of mine from Revenue down here who would never forgive me if I didn't point out that a lot of Revenue staff have to do things when there's nobody looking as well, and they have to do it well. So um, um, we'll say no more than that. Take forgiveness later. <laughs> George. Uh, I'm a former police officer working for one of the civil service units for years now. I left some 15 years ago, but just an observation on the promotion and, and Bob's point. Roughly 80% of the guard organisation come in as guards and will leave as guards. Yeah. Therefore, one in five will become sergeants. Yeah. That's it. Roughly one in 12 sergeants will become inspectors. 97% of the force will forever be in the two basic grades. Yeah. That in itself creates problems. No matter who gets promoted, Irrespective of the system, four out of five won't be. I remember doing an exercise some years ago in Templemore with a hundred young people. I was there to talk about fitness for life and sport and all the rest of it. And we finished early, we got into talking about future. Because since 1988, we changed the process. The Walsh Report brought in a lot more educational standards and all the rest of it. But they all nearly want to be commissioner, but that's not possible. And I said to my hundred, okay, guys, will 20 stand up? He said, that's how many sergeants you're going to have in the law of averages. And I have 80 sitting down. I understand, said, oh, Christ. Now I said, of, it, of that 20, will 18 now sit down, please? I now have two standing. I said, guys, that's how many inspectors you're going to have. And after that, 
It's in the lap of the gods who go and swear after that. That's the reality. 97% are in two basic grades, and it'll be forever thus. Might be 97 and a half, but if you add it up, you have 40 something chiefs, 100 and something superintendents, you have 300 odd inspectors, you have a number of commissions, you have about 500 people out of 15, 16,000 in the higher echelons. So no matter what you do with the promotion, we'll all be looking at each other, Jesus, how did he get it? No matter how good he or she is, that's the reality of promotion in the organization. So it's complex. We're all looking at each other when somebody gets promoted, irrespective of whether they deserve it. And by and large, most of them do deserve it. And that's your problem. Just make, I, I agree with that. And the other point I want to make, and I made this point as far back as 2007. I had left in 2003. I said it to a former Minister for Justice, Minister, you're not promoting sergeants, you're going to reap it where it went. The sergeant, the duty sergeant, is the mentor, the person that sees things get done. And when that got stripped out, you go to Garda districts now, and I bet you the police authority will know. There are several districts that will have a station sergeant, they may not have a duty sergeant. They are the kingpin, men and women, who mentor, who cajole, who help people. You run a system with them, you teach them the basics. And within a year, they have all the necessary positive cultures and ability to do things. And they will go on and become good officers. That is one of the most fundamental aspects of the whole thing, the duty sergeant. And if we had the enough of them, you wouldn't have half the problems we're now encountering. Two very brief comments on that. Like one is, there's a, there's a positive in there, because when I came to the organization first and I started looking, I had that concern that 80% of people come in, and, but what we got in this survey was a real sense of the variety of the job, right? So, so I can be a guard for my whole career, but I can actually change my job and my role kind of several times over, over that lifetime. And the other bit is, I have a diagram back in the office to explain to teams the shape of the organization. You have this long, thin line and a little pyramid kind of dropped on top of it, right, to, to reflect. And, and I'm not going to get into the, whether that's right or not, but one of the challenges if this was a private organization, you could accelerate culture change by moving people out and bringing people in at various levels in the organization. And that, that's very difficult to do in law enforcement generally because of the, the type of training and the type of... So I think it's one of the challenges as we move forward is how do you take that, the, the group that were in the zero to three year service and how do you keep them green as they grow up through the organization? Because if you look at places like New Zealand and West Mids, it, it takes a couple of generations of policing is kind of five to 15 years, and it'll take a couple of generations, I think, to, to fully kind of change any culture like this. I have a young lady over here, but just before um, I pass on on the promotion point, just two observations from the authorities' work. The perception of favoritism and is pervasive, and it isn't just about promotion. It's, it's, in, this, it's in this data. It's also anecdotally in a lot of material that has come to the authority. So it's, it, and it's, so therefore it is corrosive. It is nothing, well I won't say it's nothing, it has obviously something to do with the point George made that a very limited cohort of people will get promoted. But if there isn't some sense of felt fairness, that old trade union notion of felt fairness in the organization, then you have a whole nother problem and that's, really the, the, the trend that's coming through in the evidence here, and it isn't just confined to promotion. And I think that's just um, an important point to make. Now, the lady here at the end. Um, Karen McLaughlin from the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Um, the first question, David, um, across uh, all the domains, equality scores seem to be quite low. And I'm just wondering, did anything come up in your focus groups um, to shed some further light on that? The second question then, uh, which you may reflect on or other members of the panel might um, want to take into consideration is around next steps and uh, the public sector equality and human rights duty, which requires um, public bodies and Angarda Siakana being one um, to promote uh, equality and human rights for, and eliminate discrimination for both staff and for service users. Now, given that this um, audit uh, shows up a lot of issues um, in relation to equality and human rights that staff may have, how will these findings be taken forward in the assessment process that's required by the duty and strategic planning and annual reporting that flows from that as well? Thanks. 
so just just on equality, when we explore that, um, it is so uh, the the sample sizes for um, as 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 my friend here has pointed out in the photograph on page five, the sample sizes for uh, gender diversity, et um, ethnicity, or sexual orientation are quite small. Um, and yet the equality score comes down quite, and I, it, was used as, it was used as a tag for, is everybody treated equal? It actually goes in a straight line back to the meritocracy issue, right? So, and the performance management issues. And, and a lot of these things are interconnected. So equality was, because the statements that made it up, which is explained in appendix two or three, I can't remember, but is, show that some of those statements you could interpret as, you know, am I treated fairly? Am I treated equally when it comes to things like promotions? But it's absolutely, it is a core issue, and the reason it, it drags down the scores across the three pillars exactly is, is it's, it's, a, it's a common narrative um, across the organization. Um, the piece on next steps, you know, my job is to get this bit done, but, um, but I do know from our engagement over the last couple of months of the organization, they're, they're acutely focused on how do, we, how do we drive some meaningful change off this, and in a way that is aligned with human rights and equality and making sure we're the, the, the best organization we'll be for our members and for the public. So I'm sure the deputy will pick that up in his closing remarks. John Parrish and then Mark. Josephine, thank you. I, I'd just like to say that this report gives us a great baseline as the lived experience of the people that contributed <coughs> to it, and it's undoubtedly representative. But I'd like to respond to Tim. In reading this report, I came away with a huge sense of optimism. And I think the darkest hour is the one before the dawn, and I think in many ways this allows us to see the contours of the road that lies ahead and the things that we need to do. There are some very real signal changes that I think can be made by the leadership of the organization. And we're coming to a cusp of leadership change. We're coming to the report to the Commission on the Future of Policing, which Tim is a part of. We're coming to, I think, a real opportunity to begin to consider the organization holistically and without driving in the rear view mirror. And I think that's a huge reason for, for optimism. And the most important reason that I'm harnessing on is the organization is making a statement of a willingness to embrace change. And across the cohort that responded to this, that is very clearly visible in the data. People are unhappy with the status quo, and appropriate vision will lead people, as you said, Tim, into a changed environment. Thanks, John. Um, Margaret? Um, David, just in terms of your experience of other large organizations... Sorry, Margaret, would you just introduce yourself, just because I know you? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Just in terms of other large organisations that this type of work Large has been done in. Policing authority. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the type of scores that have come out here, what impact does a score like that generally have in terms of an organisation's capacity to engage in change or ability to affect change generally? And then the second question, could you speak a little to your recommendation that you don't see the response to this, uh, that a programmatic multi-project response isn't one that you would recommend. Can you speak to a little to that yeah. to explain that? Um, so first thing, so, so if I take the first part, the, the, the issue for me about, uh, about that pause and reflect period I think is important because I, I think, you know, we've, we've had cynics on Twitter and other places talk about should we do all this anyway, all right? Um, but actually, it's, it's a completely different thing when you suspect or believe or feel something to when you see it in hard data, right? And, and I, know, I, I know last Friday morning, I guarantee every chief superintendent in the country flipped to the back to find out what score did their division get, right? And so there's a whole load of reflection um, going on across. So starting last week, I was invited by the commissioner to go and speak to all superintendents and above. Um, and the equivalent civilian uh, grades to talk about what's coming and what the results are going to look like. And I, I, I think there's a, there's a period where the, the organization needs to internalize this and accept it, right? This is what everybody in the organization thinks, and they've now said it out loud. And sometimes you need to, to just let that settle in the room for a bit and have a kind of few moments to, to think about that. So I don't think this is one you can just take as a bump in the road and move on. Right? And I'm talking about a short period. I'm talking about a matter of weeks, not a, an enormous long period. But, and, and that's not a do nothing, stand still period. That's an actually having leadership out at every level. Now leadership to find a superintendent and above out talking to members about how do you feel about this and what do you think we should do about this. So that's, that's one piece. So I, I think it's difficult for organizations to take negative messages like this. That's the first piece. 
Um, so, so, and let me thank you for the opportunity. To when I say it shouldn't be programmatic, I don't mean there shouldn't be a program. And I think there should be, sorry, my belief as an outsider is there is evidence here that you need to address a culture program within the Garda Shikana. And I know the executive and the senior leadership team feel strongly about that as well. Um, my issue is I, I, would be ca I would strongly caution against, you know, you, you could go through, because all the data is there to go through and say, here's 83 statements, here's the score we got, there's the scores we need to fix. Um, you know, Let's, let's figure out an initiative and a program against each one of those. That'll give me a line on a spreadsheet, and then I will put people through a series of activities that will help to move the score, right? And it's a bit like the beatings will continue until morale improves problem, right? Uh, like what I, what, I, what, what I believe works very strongly, and, and I've, I've, I've shared with some of you in the room, when I started in um, management consulting, we got trained in culture change, and it was all about that. It was all about that programmatic, Lots and lots of interventions and classrooms and workshops and posters on the wall. And, and, and there is a role for some of that. But I, I think, and again, with the caveat, there's better academics here than me, but a lot of the literature around how people absorb is around behaviours and example behaviours. And you need a program so people, the key exam, you identify the key exemplars, you identify what the behaviours are, you put the two together, and then you start celebrating and talking about it. And, and I believe you can make that into a program that satisfies everybody, um, all the stakeholders, the, the actual members, because they're actually the most important stakeholder, the public, and then all of the external bodies and stakeholders here that were making progress on this, even before you get to the next culture audit in 18 or 24 months. Um, but you can make a program of that without making it that programmatic, you know, hundreds of lines on a project chart and, and thousands of things to do on a spreadsheet. That, that's, that's the reaction I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about. But I, I, I don't believe that's going to happen, and I think the organization is, is trying to respond in a different way. But that in itself is a challenge, because that's saying to, 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 to fix something that has grown up over time, you need to respond in a way that's different. Because if you respond in the same way, there's danger you compound some of the issues about distance from leadership and lack of trust and not enough two-way communication and so on. Is that okay? Thanks, David. Yeah. I have a, I'm just um, a sort of a time check. I'll come to you in a second, Fergus. We have time for a couple of more questions, and then I'll be coming back uh, to, the, to the podium, just so they're not caught on the hop. Fergus. Uh, thanks. Um, Fergus Healy is my name. I'm uh, the General Secretary of the Chief Superintendents Association. I suppose, first of all, I'd like to welcome the report. Um, I think it's good to have a document that you can reflect on an organization that you work in and you get you know, positive feedback, whether you like to read what's written on the report or not is another matter. Um, just two things that would jump out to me, I suppose, and they're interrelated, is that you know, we talked about the age profile and the length of service and a lot of the red scores fell into that category. And if you look at then the divisions that had the same type of scoring and the age profile of the people in those divisions, did you examine that or did you throw any sort of correlation on it or if you did, how did you weight that and the findings in those divisions? Right, so the honest answer is no, right? So, so did I go down and do age analysis down at divisional level? We didn't, right? One of the suggestions we've made is you, you've got to be careful because some of the scores that some of the divisions that got green didn't necessarily get green didn't get up into the eight so green just means you're you're better than the pack but doesn't mean you've actually got a good score so it was just caution making that into a league table um, I, what I would say like one of the things I, I think would be worthwhile as you think about next steps is trying to understand what are the differences, right? What are the environmental differences? The policing challenges are different division by division. Some of the history of how the culture has developed there. Um, one thing that came out strongly, I, I'm not familiar at chief superintendent, but at superintendent rank, um, a lot of commentary about the frequency of change, right? So you've only just figured out the boss and how the boss likes to work and the boss gets moved and, and changed and a new one arrives and that lack of consistency. Now, I can give you lots of good arguments as to why you should rotate people at that grade in any organization and, and keep things fresh, but it's the lack of, and I'm not talking about you know, the code or how we police or what the operation is. I'm, I'm talking about more basic stuff like, well, this guy or girl gave me lots of feedback and this guy or girl doesn't give me any, right? This guy or girl expects lots of detail, this guy or girl doesn't expect it. And, and just 
the constant for if you're a sergeant and inspector in that environment as well as everything else you've got to go on it's difficult and more consistency around behaviors there but if you actually look at the findings in the report you'll see that you know the city dublin city yeah. findings stand out they do and if you you know i think from someone who's worked in the organization for 35 years you know, i could have told you that <laughs> most people want to leave to go to a, a, an, an area where it's uh, more satisfactory to work. Yep. It is. There's a lot of pressures associated with working in an, a, a significant urban area. And um, whereas, if you compare the findings to the west coast of Ireland and look at all the findings on the green that's all along there, yeah. you know there has to be some weighting put on the findings to come up with a more definitive answer to the issues that were being raised. That's the point. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I, 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 I can see the geographic split. We also need to make sure that in the area where policing is the most challenged, you need the strongest culture, because that's where you have the most potential for things to go wrong as well, and you need to make sure that, because it goes back to my commentary, culture is about doing the right thing all the time, not just when, when it's easy or okay to do it. Sorry. No, that's fine. I was just going to say as well, um, you know, waiting might actually even it out but then you would have an even set of interventions, and you don't need an even set of interventions if there are different realities and different divisions. The interventions required, the environmental factors are different, so I'm not sure that evening it out um, uh, would necessarily give you the kind of diagnosis you need for, for the next steps. So, um, Mary Rose? Yeah. Just here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, as you know, I have a profound interest in change leadership in organizations and have worked all over the world with the UN and the World Bank and so on. And the really interesting thing, and you know this already, I'm sure, David, and, and all of you, is that change, just what you were saying, just I wasn't going to come in until you said that, is that it has to be both top down mm. and profoundly bottom up yeah. because if not it's seen as an authoritative move and then especially in bureaucratic organizations people just freeze in the headlights or pretend to tick the boxes or just kind of ah, sure, it's only more of this messy stuff that you kind of referred to this earlier so putting together teams of people as you say at divisional level who are a mixture of groups, who are like project teams, and they then end up almost collaborating and competing with each other in ways that the whole energy shifts, because now it's happening. But in order to do that, and my second point, is you really have to make sure that, you know, first-line supervisors and all over the, the, the economic downturn for the last 10 years, crises have happened in big international organizations because management was not being trained anymore. So there's a whole Temple More piece in this, there's a whole training piece, there's a whole piece there for both the top down, the change implementation, but also, especially as you said, David, first line supervision being so critically important. And one more point related to an earlier one in promotion, on my, my MBA program full-time this year, I, I do one piece of research every year. And what do most people want to do? 20 years ago, everybody wanted to get up the ladder in the organization. Now, and this is a, a piece of valid research, most people want to get expertise within an area rather than the hierarchical shift. But then you've got to look at the reward systems and make sure that they work as well. And if you were to say what is the biggest single factor in things going wrong in organizations, it's the reward system, as you quite rightly identified. Thank you, Mary Rose. Uh, thank you. Um, John O'Keefe, uh, Communications Director for the Garda Representative Association. Can I say this is maybe a slightly unusual situation insofar as I find myself and Antoinette agreeing wholeheartedly on everything? <laughs> we, I, it's a bit big of me to say we represent 97%, but I suppose we do on those figures that George gave earlier on. Um, David, I think you gave a figure of, was it 3.75% or something like that, thought that nothing would be done? 
That seems a very high figure. Um, my experience would seem to suggest that nobody really thinks anything's going to be done. I have spoken to people who've done this audit and they've enjoyed it. Uh, literally, they're the words, they've, they've enjoyed it from a th therapeutic basis. But of course, the whole point about therapy is at the end of it, there might be a result. So I suppose this is for Deputy Commissioner Toomey. I've got my tweeting thumb on me today. I'm feeling very Trumpish. If I was to send a tweet out later, to the members of the association, maybe you might be able to give me one, one nugget of one thing. I mean, it could be from as, as little as cargo pants for uniform, um, or it might be something more substantial, but it would be nice to be able to just know that uh, journey that we're going on, that incremental journey has started today. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm going to ask one question now to bring it to a conclusion, something that's been on my mind, and, uh, and then we'll come to the panel, okay? David, in, in, the, in the report you reference the Code of Ethics, now this, the Policing Authority, we're very proud of the Code of Ethics. We established it uh, at the beginning, at the end of 2016, launched at the beginning of 2017, and we're very proud as well that in terms of your scores, the one that comes nearest to your eight yeah. is, is the alignment with the Code of Ethics. Um, but that's hugely important as well that in a policing authority, in a policing organisation, Strong alignment with ethics is enormously important. But in the body of the report, you reference that conclusion and you connect it with discipline. So if people are only ethical because they're afraid of being disciplined, that kind of rains on my parade a little bit. You know, it, 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 it dampens my sense. Yeah, I, th I think I know the comment you're referring so, to. So, um, so leaving aside the, the, the sort of drafting point, yes. which we talked about, exactly. it's just the the uh, assessment I don't of ethical behaviour connecting with discipline, kind of. So if I take, if I take all the data points, if I take the, the quant data, the open text and the focus groups, I, I think people responded most positively to the code of ethics because it gives them tangible things. So it is much, when, we, when you're putting statements down around values and vision for the organisation as opposed to honesty and integrity, right? or duty to uphold the law. I think people can connect with that in a much more visceral way and, and understand it. Um, and I think that's why the, the, there's a much stronger alignment. And, and, to, and to John's point, because someone else made the same point, it's not a 3.7%. It's that the mean, the average score was 3.7. So on a scale of one being strongly disagree. So, so I, I think alignment to a set of values is, I, I think that's why the Code of Ethics core is stronger than everybody else, as opposed to it's just a discipline issue. Right? And it's something we should be pleased about. Absolutely. Right. Very much so. That's Sorry, if that's my last about. comment, can I just make, because it's been, I, on a theme no, today... Right. I'm oh, about to. I, oh, well, sorry, maybe they may have questions for you, but go on. Say I, I just want, want to say one thing, which yeah. is lots of you have opened up by saying congratulations or thank you, right? And in the spirit of I, teams and organisations, there's a big team in PwC have worked on this. I just come out and talk. So from the designer to the, the team who did all the focus groups to the team who did all the quant data, um, this isn't my report, it's, it's actually the guards report in terms of the data and where it's come from, but I do want to acknowledge my own team, so thank you guys. Thanks David. So Mark, you had a question and obviously any comment you want to make. Well, I'd like to respond to Antoinette. Um, I had a busy division in London, I slept at night because I knew I had an inspector on duty supported by a number of sergeants. Um, so if anything happened, our new staff was supported. There's lots of youngsters coming into the organisation, probationers. They need to have those frontline supervisors there to lead them through the organisation. Uh, the associations are key stakeholders. I was quite lucky. We had one to deal with that represented from Garda rank up to superintendent. Um, so it was much easier, but they're a critical stakeholder. And I found that you need to engage them before the problem becomes a problem to go to them with ideas. If you're going to change a policing model, you're going to do something different, go to the associations immediately to engage them, to get them to buy into the process, rather than waiting for things to happen. I'm going to slightly disagree with George, and we've met previously. Uh, talking to people, and it's Mary's point, it isn't just about promotions. I think people are realistic. They want opportunities to develop. They want to become detectives or go to, to deal with firearms or do something different. And I think there is a lack of sense of security about the processes for internal processes, selections, transfers. It isn't just about promotions. People don't trust the current systems, and that could be a perception for some, could be a reality uh, for others. Uh, I worked in the Met, and we had a sea change. It was Stephen Lawrence, the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Uh, and my organisation at that point was at the lowest it had ever been. People were embarrassed to say that they were a police officer. 
lots of terrible mistakes, but I take John's point, out of that terrible incident and poor policing came a different organisation that embraced the challenge but changed. And it was amazing how quickly the organisation came out of a terrible time. Morale was really low, but very quickly the organisation came out because we properly trained people to deal with the most difficult situations. Uh, we developed our staff, we re-empowered our frontline supervisors, and it was amazing how quickly we came out of it. So I'm like John, I would be optimistic, but this could be a sea change to go forward. And small steps, I think if you give staff new uniform or try to resolve some of the things that drive the frontline staff mad, you get buy-in very quickly. Uh, and it's not to buy that, but actually to show them that we are taking on board some of the things that we've been saying for a long time and just physically show them some change. Thank you, Mark. Mary Ellen, would you like to add anything? Well, just briefly, this is a report which for some may uh, voice uh, what they know already and have been themselves saying. It may be new to other people. Uh, what happens is for two groups. It is for leadership, it is for management, and it is for the members. A and where it goes, will ultimately be for the, uh, for the persons uh, deeply affected by the uh, contents of this report. For oversight bodies, if it goes forward positively, incorporates all ranks and members, I think we'll have less work. So for us, it would be a good thing. Before I ask you and John, we'll pause. Could you Right. John, I had said to uh, the Deputy Commissioner that I would invite him to respond generally and but also to make any closing remarks you want to make. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Josephine, and thanks, everybody, uh, for the comments here today. I suppose at the out outset, I'd like to repeat what everybody else has said about uh, the work done by David McGee and the team from PwC. Uh, it's an outstanding piece of work. Uh, I'd also like to include in that Gurchin Singh uh, from our own organisation as the head of the analysis service who provi provided support right throughout the, 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 the programme. There are also other groups, the steering group and the external advisory group um, that have provided uh, a lot of support and assistance and I would also like to, to thank them. I suppose there has been lots of uh, discussion points here today and there's lots, lots of points raised uh, and I'm very tempted to do what we would probably do which was dive straight down into the detail and say, here's what we're doing about this, here's what we're doing about that. Uh, but uh, at the outset, I'll, 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 I'll promise I'll try not to, George. I'm not sure I'll succeed, but I would certainly try not to. One thing that I would say at the outset is, this is a tremendous opportunity for Angarda Síochána. This is probably one of the greatest opportunities um, that we have ever uh, had and will have. We have an amount of data which is what we're saying about ourselves. It's what we say about ourselves and what we say about the organisation. And it gives us the greatest opportunity to drive change and improvement because the organisation is asking. Right across the organisation, we want to change. We want to be different. And with that opportunity, of course, comes enormous responsibility for the leadership of the organisation. Um, the one thing that I would say in terms of the next steps is it's important to understand exactly what is being said. And even here in the room today, we've had different versions of exactly what the message is. We've had different views and opinions as to how we should approach it. Should we go down the line by line uh, actions? Should we deal with it more holistically? And we have to take that time to understand exactly what it is we're saying about it. There is the natural tendency to blame. Well, it's those at the top, it's those at the bottom, it's those in the middle, it's everywhere like that. The important issue and the most important point that is being made here is that this is an opportunity for us to learn, to improve, and create the organisation that everybody inside the organisation and the community so dearly wants. Everybody is proud to be a member of Angarda Shikana. They're proud of the, want, the, work, the work that they do, but they want to do it better. 
And I think this gives us the opportunity to do that. But I think that if we jump into a reaction now, the danger is we'll go line by line and we will miss something. And the overall objective is to improve the organisation, the culture of the organisation. So understanding the detail. Why is one division lower than the other? Why are the people in special crime operations happier than those on the front line? Why do the front line feel the way they feel? So I think it's really, really important that we take the time and the opportunity to really understand what we're saying. Culture, is, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I met with representatives from New Zealand police not so long ago, and I asked them the same question. How did they go about it? What was the one thing that they needed when they had the findings? And what they said was they needed time and they needed space. And they would say that it was around five years before they began to come out of the difficulties that that they began. Yes, the shoots were there earlier. Yes, things began to turn and were really good, but it took that length of time before they began to see it. So culture is something that's, you, you know, everybody would have a, a different definition as to what culture is, but we all know it's hugely important. So it's important to get this right. It's important that we, we fix it. And what I can say on behalf of the commissioner and the CEDA leadership team is that we are absolutely hell-bent on ensuring that we take every action and everything that we need to do to make sure that we address all of the issues that are raised. I, I certainly like when it says in the report how it draws behaviours as the bridge between the cultures and the values. And I think that's something we should take time to reflect on. Because if a guard anywhere in the country is not behaving in accordance with the values and the cultures of the organisation, we've missed something coming out of this report. I suppose as I, as, as I want to conclude, um, in the area of supervision, uh, I certainly am one of those guards who remember my first sergeant. And he had that unique ability to put his arm around me when he needed to, and then do whatever the opposite of that is <laughs> when he needed to do also. But the role and the importance of, this, of the frontline supervisor, the influence he had on the cultures that I adopted in the organisation, the values that have been ingrained in me. So it is hugely important that that is done. And the role that supervisors, that managers, that leaders, that everybody in the organisation need to do, I think are hugely important. In a strange way, I'm very excited by this report. I'm really excited by this report because it's the first time that we have very, very rich data on which we can make all the positive changes that the organisation says it, it, itself. Just coming back to a question that Antoinette raised, of course the associations are hugely important. Everybody's important in the organisation. Everybody. This will not be done top down or bottom up. And if we try to do it that way, I believe that will be one of the key mistakes. This is the organisation's report. It's our view on what we want. And it will be our response that will give us the results from this that we should need. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, here who came along this afternoon. Our objective was, apart from having a different type of event to what we usually have, was to provide an opportunity for people to get behind the headlines, either the headlines in the media or indeed the headlines in the report, to give you an opportunity to ask uh, the report's, well, part author, I know, part leader part, yeah. of a team author, uh, to explain why things were expressed in certain ways and how the methodology was developed and so on and so forth. And I want to thank you all for coming along and for participating. And I hope that you found it helpful to be able to get, um, as I say, behind the headlines of what is an extremely rich report. Um, on first reading, you think you've absorbed it all, and then you read it a second time, and you read, then you read the appendices with, with the various breakdowns, and you find there's something else there that you didn't spot before. I know many of you will have other opportunities in other roles to engage uh, with it again, but today may have given you an opportunity to think about deeper questions the next time. Um, and, and so I hope from that point of view, you will have found it useful. Um, from the authorities' point of view, and a bit like John, I'm, I'm a glass half full person always, and I think 
the Garda Síochána are to be commended for carrying out the audit. They're to be commended for publishing the audit. Because it isn't pretty, but it's an enormous, rich source of data. It's authentic, it provides insights, it provides a diagnosis. Over to you, in many respects, to take that diagnosis and then form the individual elements of the response. From the authorities' point of view, we'll obviously ask you, when you have done that period of reflection, what form that response is going to take. We'll ask you to put some of those elements in order I, so that we can see what might happen before, before what. Um, I think you got a lot of messages here today about the first touch being important um, uh, around visibility and around something that is felt and, and, and seen uh, to look a bit different, to see if you could move the needle on that 3.7, um, because that's probably the, the, the worst number in some respects in terms of what it says about people's faith in, in what will happen next. So um, I'm not going to um, expect you to do anything, uh, to say anything immediate, because I think David is right. Uh, this has to be absorbed, debated, considered. But I do think, uh, I mean, I know the authority will, will be back to the commissioner um, in due course to, to get a more structured, action-oriented response. I think this document sitting alongside the forthcoming report of the Commission on Future Policing and the other piece of work that the Garda published, which I think, I never miss a chance to promote it, is the Attitude Survey, the Public Attitude Survey, which again is a, a rich piece of work and a brave piece of work that is published every quarter. So there's a set of material available to you and will be available later on uh, when the Commission reports to do, um, to form the vision that's looked for here and the next steps. And uh, I, again, I just want to conclude by thanking my colleagues on the panel, the team and the authority for um, making the arrangements here today. It's a new venue for us. Our colleagues who kept us, who kept us heard most of the time, thank you. And I want to particularly ask you to join with me in thanking David for the frankness with which he approached uh, the job here this afternoon. Thank you, David. So, Shinna Will, the next uh, Policing Authority public meeting is on the 20-somethingth of June. I always say, the, final, the fourth week in June, the next Policing Authority event in public, and uh, we're, we're adjourned until then. Thank you. <laughs>